We've talked about other invasive animal impacts. So we've talked about Burmese pythons. I've looked at brown tree snakes in Guam. There's plenty of invasive animals. They simply don't have the ability to create damage like wild pigs or feral swine do. There's often several numbers that are quoted associated with uh, wild pig damage to the United States. The most frequently quoted one is approximately $1.5 billion annually. That number is definitely low. One implication of, of wild pigs or feral swine is that they could get a disease like African swine fever or foot and mouth disease. If they spread that within their own population or to domestic livestock, we're talking instantly billions of dollars. Uh, we're too reliant on exports, and if we get a disease like African swine fever, foot and mouth disease, or classical swine fever, it will shut down our trade. They are unparalleled in their ability to create damage and harm. Feral swines can transmit 30 diseases and nearly 40 parasites to humans, wildlife, pets, and livestock. And so for our national surveillance program, we do disease surveillance on three specific diseases, which is classical swine fever, pseudorabies virus, and swine brucellosis. Classical swine fever is a foreign animal disease that can have huge implications on the United States pork production. And that's why we continue, continue to test for classical swine fever throughout the country as well as other U.S. islands. One of the major health risks that feral swine poses to people is a disease called brucellosis. It's caused by a bacteria, and since 2010, there have been over 1,200 cases of brucellosis diagnosed in the United States. There are other diseases that feral swine can spread to people, including leptospirosis, E. coli, influenza viruses, trichinosis, toxoplasmosis, just to name a few. After samples are collected and all the information has been reviewed by the wildlife disease biologist of each state, these samples are then shipped to the National Feral Swine Program here in Fort Collins, Colorado at the National Wildlife Research Center. When receiving these samples, the National Feral Swine technicians then organize samples, ensure that all the data is correct with those. After that, all these samples get shipped to diagnostic laboratories. These diagnostic laboratories then send our team results of all of these samples, if they're rather positive for the diseases or negative, in which we then enter into our system. Our National Feral Swine Program then relates all this information to the states, and we also provide visuals to these states to let them know areas where diseases may be prevalent. Keeping track of the seroprevalence of these diseases is quite important. When positives are found throughout the states, the National Feral Swine Program reports these to our stakeholders as well as collaborators. This allows the stakeholders and collaborators to know where these diseases are found throughout the state. This is important because as some of these diseases are endemic to feral swine, we really want to reduce the risk of any of these diseases being transmitted to any of the domestic stock. The risk for getting brucellosis from feral swine in the general population is low, but if you're a hunter, have contact with, or eat meat from feral swine, you should be aware of brucellosis. Yeah, I like to look at feral swine in terms of, um, in terms of really firefighting. Prevention is key. Preventing them, just like preventing a wildfire or preventing a house fire, is way cheaper than trying to control that once it's spread. Ag dollars turn over in the American economy. They provide jobs, they provide revenue, tax base. So it's not, these problems don't just impact producer profits and stay there. They don't stop at the farm gate. It impacts the community, the state, and everyone that relies on those crops to be in the market.